this is recorded. Oh my Okay, uh, good afternoon everybody. Uh, welcome to this session on pan-European journalism initiatives, ambitions and challenges. Uh, I'm David Levy uh, from the Royce Institute. I'm going to chair this. And on my left I have Natalie Nugaret, editorial board member of The Guardian, who runs their Euro and also who runs their Europe Now initiative. On my right, Sylvie Kaufman, editorial director of Le Monde, uh, who also writes a lot in Le Monde and has had oversight in the past of their Europa initiative. Um, and Ryan Heath, at the end here, who's political editor of Politico Europe, who's heavily engaged in their coverage of European elections. I'm just gonna say a few words of introduction and then we'll go to each of our speakers to speak in, in, in order from left to right. They'll speak for five minutes or so and then we'll open up to discussion um, with everybody in the room. Uh, just by way of introductions, we've got <coughs> European elections in just over a month from now. And, uh, but it's still the case that the vast majority of European journalism is produced within national boundaries for national audiences. Um, and when it comes to coverage of Europe, whether it's other EU countries or whether it's developments in Brussels, um, <coughs> the tendency has been to cover all of those things through a national lens. Indeed, when it comes to covering Brussels, some national politicians have... Um, prided themselves and the journalists um, have reflected that on the way that they depict um, events there, very much a sort of battle between their national capital and other countries or Brussels. Um, uh, I think that's a general trend, not exclusively restricted to the UK in spite of the particular issues that we're facing on that at the moment. All the speakers here are engaged in um, different approaches to, to covering Europe. Um, Two, Natalie and Sylvia from long-established media with a strong web presence, and Ryan is from a digital-only outlet, uh, Politico oh, Europe. In fact, we have a weekly newspaper. Do you? An award-winning yes. weekly newspaper. Okay, I'm sorry about that. You better get, send me a free subscription, and then I, I won't make that mistake again. Um, so our goal in this session is to hear from each of them briefly, really, about their experiences uh, and the ambitions and the challenges they face, both in terms of what they're trying to do that's different from the general order of, of journalism in this space. Uh, um, what do they know about demand, reader interest in this? And what's most difficult? What have, been the, what have been the successes and what have been the problems they faced? And what can other people in the room and other people who are watching this, what can they learn about that? I'm conscious on this platform, we only represent a small proportion of the kind of activity that's going on in this space, and there'll be other people in the room or in the conference as a whole, and the festival as a whole, who are trying things in this space of a very different kind. So my aim is to make the conversation interactive after we've heard from the panelists. So, as I said, each speaker is going to speak for five to seven minutes, um, and then we move on to discussion. So I'm going to call on Natalie first. Okay. Natalie. Thanks, David. Uh, Good afternoon, everybody. I wanted to, to do two things in just a few minutes. One is tell you a little bit about what, um, what The Guardian is trying to do in terms of looking at Europe and bringing together um, various perspectives on Europe. And the second thing I wanted to do, which is I, I, would, take off my, I would take off my Guardian hat for that, is to really um, make a pitch to you about um, one thing I'm, I'm uh, increasingly convinced of, which is that if... Uh, if we want uh, a space for quality information across Europe, as, as you know, people, uh, as European citizens, 
as people who are, I'm sure, worried about some of the you know, political trends on the continent and who know very, uh, a lot about the difficulties that the media within the national silos are experiencing. Um, if we want to try to be you know, forward-looking, I think we will increasingly have to think in terms of a public interest quality information space for all of Europe. Um, and to, 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 to try to uh, collectively invent that space. And I think it has to start with journalists becoming uh, you know, more aware of that and looking for creative ways for, for this to happen, not just wait for the legacy media within the national silos to come up with, with a solution or wait for the platforms, the digital platforms to do it. Um, um, we're, we're all as worried, as Europeans, we're all as worried as many American journalists are about the information environment and disinformation environment. We have that same problem in Europe. But in Europe, we have um, extra difficulties, of course. We, we are, uh, you know, a mosaic of languages, of uh, national cultures. Uh, and so we have obstacles to overcome that American journalists don't, and American media organizations don't have to overcome in the same way. Um, and I, I would, um, you know, I'd look forward to hearing from the room because I'm sure some of you are, uh, are already invested or engaged in that cross-border dimension of journalism in Europe. Um, but I, I, I would like in the coming months, so I welcome anybody who wants to come up to me afterwards, I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to actually literally brainstorming with as many people uh, as possible who are interested on what uh, a genuine pan, you know, European cross-border, cross-cultural, cross-linguistic uh, quality information space might be. And I think we could, we could tap into new technologies for that uh, and new innovative uh, ways of funding. Um, but so to go back to my first point, which is to tell you a little bit about The Guardian. The Guardian has, um, um, a you know, in terms of its reach, it has uh, 150 million uh, unique browsers per month, uh, two-thirds of which are outside the UK. And um, as far as Europe is concerned, not including the UK, it's roughly 40 million uh, unique browsers per month. As you know, a unique browser is not a, a human being necessarily, right? So uh, it, it's, it, it's the measurement that, that many of us still use. Um, and it is, of course, historically a UK-based uh, media organization that has gone global. Uh, it has an American digital edition, Guardian US, and it has uh, uh, an Australian digital edition, Australia, uh, Guardian Australia. It does not have uh, a European digital edition, which um, me and a few people think should happen at some point. But Nevertheless, it's, it's, it's uh, well aware that uh, the continent is a natural uh, terrain for it, and our readership is already extremely strong across Europe. Why is that? Of course, we're in English. Uh, we have that kind of global, you know, international outlook to, 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 uh, to ourselves. And of course, we're free. We're for free. You know, anybody can read us. I, I, I come across, you know, constantly come across people, you know, if, if I'm in Poland or uh, in, in Germany or uh, uh, in, the, in the Scandinavia, I c I'll constantly come across people who say, well, I, re I read The Guardian, you know, and they're, and, and they're often rather young, youngish, um, and they are, it's become part of their daily feed of, of news. But we've tried to do a little bit more um, as, as we become you know, aware of the fact that despite Brexit, uh, which is kind of a, a, an obsession, right, a vortex of inward-looking obsessions, despite that, uh, there is an appetite uh, in Europe, especially among uh, young, younger generation, English reading, English speaking, connected people, you know, who may, may not just be the Erasmus generation, uh, but, but um, are also in their um, urban centers, uh, people who are mobile, um, people who worry about how values are under attack across the, across the continent, people who worry about the far right, uh, who are well aware of disinformation. Um, so there's an appetite for, for uh, a media organization that would be easily, you know, usable for free or, you know, uh, and that would give people that sense of belonging to a common space. It doesn't mean you fudge national differences, but you belong to a common space. You belong to a common conversation across Europe. 
And so one of the things we did was, you know, we, of, we increased the number of people who cover Europe at The Guardian um, in recent years. Not immensely, but we did. And, and the other thing we did was we launched a, a section which I edit, and it's called Europe Now. And it brings in kind of grassroots voices from across Europe, you know, so I have fun with this. I, I, I ask, you know, people that I come across, and they can be of all different um, different backgrounds and ex personal experiences, and I ask them to share something about their personal experience, and it, they, it may be related to politics, it may be related to culture, um, and, and we publish these pieces, and some of them, uh, as long as they're kind of really personal and they say things that can interest people beyond that particular country or that particular city, they, they are rather successful and they, they help us build uh, engagement. Um, people not only, you know, will c not only click on them, but, sorry, I'm too long, he's, he's just written two minutes, so <laughs> it's gonna be two minutes. Um, and what we did, what we did uh, also is, is we launched a newsletter. Now, you know, uh, uh, it's called This Is Europe. So the section is called Europe Now. It's, you'll find it, if you, especially if you go on the opinion front page of The Guardian, there's a container there, Europe Now. It's a slow lane. And, and it produces a newsletter, which is for free, and which we have now a, a, quite a good number of subscribers for. Um, and so this is, this is the little, the space where we try to go further than just news coverage of, of European events. We try to create a space where there's a European conversation. But I think the, the overriding ambition we should all have is uh, to, try to, uh, to try to think more uh, and put more effort into something which would ultimately resemble, uh, uh, you know, a, a platform or a network of quality uh, information for all Europeans. If we keep struggling just within our national silos, we're, it's, we're not going to get there. We're, we're going to see uh, more polarization, uh, more frustration, and more difficulties for media organizations. I think it has to be uh, a, a, a pan-continental endeavor. I'll stop there. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Natalie. Just one quick question. Do you have any indication of take-up for Europe now? Or interest or any, any, any measure at all? Uh, yeah, we monitor, we monitor, you know, how well all the pieces do, um, you know. Um, I don't know how, how uh, you know, I, I, I have all these statistics. What I'm interested in are, in are the pieces that do well on two levels, both, both in terms of reach, you know, how many people come to read them, and, and, and also in terms of engagement, meaning where do people go after they've read the piece, and um, do they um, decide afterwards at some point to support The Guardian, either, you know, joining the membership or, uh, or contributing to it financially. And the, the newsletter we, we produce does lead to financial contributions, meaning that um, you know, it's not, it's not a, a, an absolute rule. Not everybody who's a subscriber to the newsletter will say, okay, I'm gonna support The Guardian financially. But it, it, does, um, it does trigger that kind of reaction, and, and I think that's one of the elements of proof that there is an appetite, there's a huge appetite for uh, things that help you get out of your national silo. You know, and the media aren't doing very well in many European countries. You know, I, I don't know if you're Italian, how, do you, how satisfied are you with the media scene in Italy? If you're Polish, there are many problems. Uh, Hungarian, you know, I no need to develop. You know? um, so there, there, there are many things that I, I think European journalists and media organizations and readers should not be left alone in their, in their okay. silos. Yeah. Thank you, thank you very much. Sylvie, what about your so, um, good afternoon. It's a different one. We, we, I'm, I'm going to tell you about this um, Europa network, or I don't know how to call, how, how to call it really. It's an un unidentified editorial object, uh, but it's been very interesting. So, um, it started at, uh, at a lunch. Uh, I think it was the end of 2011, actually. We were talking <laughs> earlier about this. Um, in Paris with... Uh, then editor of Le Monde, uh, Eric Israelevich, and Juan Luis Cebrian of El País, who was there. And uh, we had actually been cooperating on WikiLeaks when I was the editor. Uh, with, uh, that was actually a cross-European uh, cooperation, uh, one of the first. Um, so that was with the New York Times, but it was The Guardian, El País, Le Monde, and Der Spiegel. And so um, we talked about this, and then somebody said, uh, well, 
you know, we don't even have a European newspaper, it's crazy, and we say, oh yes, uh, that's really a pity, and so on. And uh, somebody said, uh, maybe we should do one, oh yes, you know. <laughs> and uh, then everybody went back to his uh, office or, or her office. And then uh, two days later, I got a call from Javier Moreno of El Pais, who was the editor of El Pais, who said, uh, Cebrian told me that you have decided to up, uh, put out a, a, magaz a European magazine. I said, well, well, not exactly. But anyway, we decided to get going. And, uh, we, you know, magazine was a bit too ambitious. So we decided to do, we recruit, to set up a group of several newspapers. So we recruited La Stampa. So it was Le Monde del Pais, La Stampa, Sudotsche Zeitung, The Guardian. And I must say, I insisted to have uh, a paper from Central Europe, because I thought it was very important. We got Gazeta Wyborcza from Poland. And so, in fact, we represented the six most populated countries of the EU, right? And so uh, we decided to meet and work on a supplement together. So we met um, every paper, you know, appointed a representative, um, and we met in Paris the six of us, and it, we had a, an editorial conference, and that became a tradition. We would meet in one of the, capi one of the six capitals, have a two or three hours uh, editorial conference to decide on the content of the supplement we were going to put out, and then have a nice lunch. And uh, <laughs> it's a very important element. <laughs> and um, so it worked quite well. It was very exciting. The first thing we found out working together in this conference was that we talked about exactly the same thing. You know, of course, we spoke English. Um, but we were talking about the same editorial objects. We knew what we wanted to do, and we had no difficulty at all explaining or communicating on what format we wanted, on you know, what, uh, so we decided on a content of a special issue, for instance, immigration, and then we said, okay, so one, one editor said, uh, we can do this news analysis piece, and then uh, the other one said, oh, we'll do this reporting bit, you know, we, it was like in a normal editorial conference. So that was a very, I think, important point that we realized that we had a common journalistic culture, and it, it was very easy to, to, to work together. Now the difficulty happened when we got the copy back uh, because we got the copy back in six languages and each one of us of course was going to publish this supplement in, in his or her national language. So that involves five translators, um, which means money. Uh, unless, I mean, you know, if it's English, some of your colleagues can translate it, but you know, Polish. Uh, not everybody speaks Polish in our newsroom. And um, so it, that, that was one thing we had underestimated, the language uh, element. Uh, the other thing is that our CEOs assumed that, in fact, what Sebrian had in mind was a business venture. They, they, and, and our CEO at Le Monde got very excited also about this because they assumed there would be advertising revenues. And we very quickly realized there was no European, pan-European advertising market. The, the advertisers want to advertise nationally, so no income. Um, so, but we, we went on, I mean, our business uh, um, managers uh, lost interest pretty quickly, I'm afraid. But editorially, we were, we were interested, all of us, the six of us, we wanted to continue. So we, we did that for a few years regularly, uh, and, and our readers appreciated, and we had uh, positive feedback. And then um, we, um, then came the story, the sad story of Europe, <laughs> which is that in 2016, uh, our colleague from The Guardian said, look, you know, uh, after the referendum, we're not going to be able to do this for a while because it's Brexit only and we're losing interest in, in European issues. So oh, I'm sorry, but we're not going to be part of this for a while. And then our Polish colleague said, you know, We've had an election and a new regime in, uh, in Poland, and Gazeta Wyborcza is now so involved in the political fight that, and also was in a difficult situation, so we were not, were not going to be able to contribute. 
Then uh, our Spanish colleague said, you know, we have this Catalan crisis and it's really consuming and, you know, consuming all our energy so we cannot contribute. Then our Italian colleague said, you know, we have this election and it's really crazy so we don't have time for uh, wider European issues. So, you know, the Franco-German tandem was left standing. And, uh, <laughs> uh, but as usual, it couldn't run alone. So we, um, we stopped for a little while, I must say, and now we are back um, with, with the European election coming. And so we had a meeting in Munich at the Süddeutsche Zeitung uh, a few weeks ago, and we decided uh, to have... Um, um, and so we are not going to do a supplement. We are going to be much more flexible, which I think is better. And actually, the Guardian never did the supplement because that's not, they don't like to do this. They don't do it, so they, and they have a different format. But it's okay. It's very free. That's also the, the thing why it, why it worked. It's that each paper was free to use the content, you know, according to its own uh, publishing habits or format. So it, it was... Um, it was uh, uh, easy. So now we're going to do several, um, we've, we've already um, started to work on several um, um, subjects uh, to, to, that we will put out in May probably because the start of the campaign is very slow. And uh, we also have started, uh, we've published the other day um, jointly, the six of us, uh, big polling operation done by a pan-European think tank, the European Council on Foreign Relations, on, um, it's called the Unlock Project, so it's, um, it's uh, a polling operation on 14 countries, including uh, ours, so it was, it was very interesting. We did that together and we had, uh, it, was, it was quite, um, uh, I thought it was quite exciting and we'll, there will be a second wave of uh, polling results um, um, later in April. So um, that's, that's about it. And, and I think we, we also did interviews together. And that, I think, has launched a kind of model. I think since we started in 2012, there have been more ventures, cross-European ventures, interviews, of course, but also, of course, we have collaborated in several... Um, uh, you know, joint investigative uh, initiatives, so all these uh, Panama Papers, and I mean, not only Europeans, but uh, Lux Leaks, uh, uh, now there's these Forbidden Stories, and so I think we realize now that we need to work together much more, and I agree with, with uh, Natalie that we need this public interest space. I don't know how we'll <laughs> manage to do it, but I think we one of the merits of Europa is that it has made us aware that there's a need for this and there's, and there's also um, a readership for this. And just one thing about the technological that, um, aspect that uh, Natalie mentioned, I think on this language problem, which is so complicated, uh, and that is also part of our European identity. It's not that we can all do everything in English. We can communicate in English, but I think there's still a need to read in all our national languages. So, but I think in the meantime, since 2012, a lot of progress has been made on the translation softwares. And, you know, it's not perfect, but it's much better than it was eight years ago. And I think probably there's some uh, positive... Um, things to look forward to on this. Thank you, Sylvie. Just one very quick follow-up on translation. Was the, you obviously said that one of the problems you faced was translation cost and that was underestimated. Was the problem the technical one of translation or was it just as much the different sort of journalistic styles of the people who were doing filing stuff for you? No, I think, I mean, if you have good translators, and we have translators for our op-ed pages, for instance, so they are used to, uh, you know, like literary translators, they are used to translate journalistic uh, uh, writing. So they adjust, if they are good, they can adjust. This is why I'm a little bit worried about those softwares, which can be very efficient, but, you know, the style may not be... Um, 
um, may, may not be, scary. yeah. And just one other thing, but we can come back to it. Uh, talking about cross-European uh, journalism, there's also another venture, which is the European Press Prize. And um, I'm honored to be on the jury of this press prize. Of the, of the, and uh, it's also, you know, an opening on so, it's so rich, the, 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 um, the offer that you have in terms of investigation, comments, reporting, it's really fascinating. So, you know, gen European journalism is really alive, I must say. Okay. Uh, thank you, Sylvie. Uh, Ryan, Sylvie was saying that the uh, European elections were a thing that had revived uh, Europa, uh, Le Monde and their partners. Uh, this is what you're focused on at the moment. So could mm -hmm. you share your experience from Politico Europe? Yep, please. Absolutely. I mean, it's absolutely the case that this is the most European of the European elections. That's probably related to immigration, climate, and Brexit, but also that is not saying much at the same time. There's never really been a properly European election, in my opinion. Um, to give you a little bit of the context, uh, Politico Europe is different from the United States Politico. Um, can I get a sense of how many people might have actually been on politico.eu? Who's checked it? Yes, it's good. <laughs> Never do you find a majority uh, for that across <laughs> the rest of Europe. Uh, it's not to say we're not successful. We just broke even for the first time in January. And we have 125 staff now, and half of them are journalists. And the rest are on the business side or an events business that's hopefully generating some journalism for us as well. And on that newspaper point, you can get the newspaper for free on our app. You can download it and print it if you want, and we'll deliver it to your home if you pay for the postage. So we, there are ways to, to get that, that print to you. Um, what I've been, one of the things I've been doing uh, is running uh, essentially all of our election coverage. And so while the official campaign is only really kicking off now, we have been running an election hub since October last year. And it's had some success, but also it's really hit some walls that I think you'll find familiar when I, I give some of these examples. Uh, we've had about 2 million page views for the stories on that hub now, but we knew that people would find it really difficult to engage with the election in a narrative form. You're not gonna read stories about 27 different countries, probably. So we tried to visualize it and graph it as much as possible. Uh, and so there are a lot of data visualizations to let you compare your experience to everyone else in Europe on that hub. And we've also tried to do things using our flagship products, which are newsletters that we email to people. And so we've gone into 19 languages um, doing our national playbooks, looking at that country and the EU election and also whatever the domestic political backdrop is at the time. It's a total nightmare doing it, let me tell you. I'm really proud that we did it, but it's, uh, it's, it's not something that will be very easy to repeat. But what that has done is it's driven 10,000 new subscribers to Politico, which doesn't sound like a lot, but in our terms, that, that is a lot. Um, and they have picked up other products that Politico has done. So I think that the European elections, there is interest there, it does drive demand. But what I've realized through this process is that it's, we're very successful on the content and in reaching a kind of wholesale market, so people like yourselves as journalists, or people who are paid to follow the EU. But in terms of reaching a mass general voter market, it hasn't been so successful. Um, maybe part of that is because we don't do uh, everything in one country or one language, but we do all of Europe just in politics and policy. And a lot of people just don't wanna make that the focus of their, their news consumption. But it really showed me that while we've kind of become financially successful now, and we have an impact certainly in Brussels, um, there's potentially some limits to, to how we do that. Um, I think that uh, there are also problems in the way the European Union organizes itself. You can't uh, complain about the institutions you've got, like that's the market that you work in. Uh, but at the end of the day, unless people can vote for a European president or really feel like they have some very direct control over who is being sent to Brussels, you know, beyond just the MEPs, I think there'll always be limits to, to how much uh, the journalism can succeed. Now, there are some exceptions to that. Uh, one of them is that we've tried to really convene that public space through what we would call stadium moments. So we're running a series of four debates. Um, we've done two of them, we've got two more to go. One on climate, one on migration, one on the case for and against the EU, and one between the commission presidential candidates. And we think that they're great ways to drive big general audiences um, to the discussion and to, to Politico as a brand as well. 
Um, and then, of course, you've got the, the issue of Brexit. You know, it's, we've heard it all before, you don't need more from me in that regard, but it does distract and consume energy. And so I think things would have been a little bit better and different had Brexit not kind of uh, intervened in this particular election. But the, the note of optimism and of caution that I would finish on is to say that it takes a long time to build these public spaces. You know, if you look at the United States 60 years into its history, I'm not sure it had a fully national public space. My own country where I grew up in Australia, it took 40 years for the first national newspaper to turn a profit. And so for Europe to build its institutions and to build a, a public space in one or in many languages, it's going to take time. So I think all of these efforts are worth it, even if they don't give you the results uh, in the very first round. Thank, thank you, Ryan. Um, Thanks, that's uh, a really good explanation of what, what you're doing. I'm really tempted to ask uh, the panel another question, but I'm gonna resist that temptation at the moment and open the floor to you. And I'd really just like to ask first, if there's anybody in the room uh, who's got a question or a couple of questions prompted by what we've heard, and then I'm gonna follow up and ask if there's anybody in the room who's engaged in something similar that they'd like to just share with us briefly. But first, if any questions prompted by what you've heard, um, I'll take a question here from that gentleman there. Uh, ah, okay. Hello. Yeah, I'd like and then to the one in front of you. <laughs> yeah. Okay, go ahead. Hello, I'd like to know your opinion on uh, installing a European public broadcaster like there is in so many national countries. Um, what kind of obstacles do we need to overcome? And like if we did that online like YouTube, would that maybe solve the problem of, yeah? and European journalism. Okay, thank you. And then I think there was a question here, which I, I, I'll take here and then I'll, yeah. Uh, yeah, Ms. Kaufman, uh, could you just uh, expand on what uh, is the editorial goal of the, um, the um, yeah, on what you're doing now, on what you were doing and what you're expecting now for, for this, new, this new edition? Okay. Um, and then is it, um, uh, yes. Sorry, it's a question. Okay, uh, I'll take a. All right, I'll take a question from you actually. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, if I understood correctly, the Guardian decided after the Brexit vote to stop the publication on Europe because they were focusing on the Brexit vote. And this doesn't really make sense to me. Shouldn't it have been the other way around? So because of the Brexit vote, so maybe there was more need for information on the EU. It's really a question I might have misunderstood. Huh? Okay. So I, I'm gonna take those three questions first and then I'm gonna come back to ask people who are trying to do something in this space. Um, I don't expect panelists to all answer each of the, each question, but you can take your pick. European public broadcaster, editorial goal of Europa, that's clearly meant for you, Sylvie, and The Guardian withdrawing from Europa because of Brexit, which, um, yeah, so. I can try public broadcasting. Okay, why don't you try that? <laughs> um, I think my thought there is that the EBU is already an excellent organizing platform, and video is exceptionally expensive. I mean, you know that. I'm not going to um, teach you the basics here. Ryan, um, say, say what EBU is. Oh, sorry, the European uh, Broadcasting Union. So the organizers of Eurovision is certainly the shortcut way to understanding that. And they're organizing the final debate in this EU election season. So there is a real value there. Sometimes there's a danger when the biggest publicly subsidized media outlet moves into all platforms. They crowd out other people's private initiatives because the little startups can't compete. So that's a danger there. But my real point is actually that I think podcasting is a very uh, exciting way to, to go into the audiovisual space, but in a cost-effective way. And it's quicker and easier to cope with the translation if you're not also coping with the cost of video. So that's certainly something Politico is trying to, to do more of. Uh, it engages with younger audiences. It's basically radio in your phone, so that's the easy way to think of it. But it hits a lot of the same notes as um, video does. So my answer is to kind of go around your point and, and tackle it a different way via the podcasting. Okay. So. Um, the goal, the editorial goal is to open up. So it's, it's an interesting question because we have correspondence in most of, I mean, in all those countries, actually, uh, the, the partners of the, of the, of the uh, newspapers we partner with. But 
the way our correspondents work and are, is different. I mean, they are French. Um, they, you know, look at the news through French lenses with their culture and what they think will be of interest to the French, uh, to readers of Le Monde. While if we publish a piece from Gazeta Viborcha or from the Deutsche Zeitung, it will be a different angle. It, um, the reporter will see things that maybe our correspondent didn't pay attention to or assume that it wouldn't be interesting or also the way they approach some, uh, um, some of the issues. Um, it's been very rewarding, I must say, and it's been fun to, to and, and we have uh, realized that um, there were things we wouldn't have published um, and that we have uh, published thanks to those uh, newspapers. So it's really a question, the goal is just to open up to the rest of Europe and to um, see the news through, you know, other European eyes, in fact. Thanks, Sophie. Yeah, just, a sh just chronologically, the, the, there was a gap indeed in the Europa project uh, and, the, and the Guardian's involvement in, in it. But actually that gap started, I think, in, uh, it was in 20, 2017 and 2018, and now, it's, and now the project has taken over. So it has, has returned, basically. So it wasn't something that stopped, you know, we didn't stop Europa on, on the 24th of June uh, 2016, right? That, that's not what happened. It's true, uh, it's true that Brexit has had an, an impact, which is like, it's like a tsunami, right, on a, on a media organization that's UK-based. And, 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 you know, the realization that something, something was, people voted in a way that you did not expect. So as for a media organization, that is a very, you know, that is a cause for a lot of introspection and, and thinking about how do you actually cover, how do you actually relate to your own, you know, uh, country and parts of it that you may not have been completely in tune with. So I think it's natural that The Guardian had this kind of more nationally inward looking phase. But at the same time, it was growing its network of people in, in Europe, and we launched at the same time Europe Now in the newsletter. So it's kind of a complex picture. It wasn't, oh, suddenly we're, we're, we're turning on back, our backs on Europe. On the contrary, you know, the editor and in editorial discussions, there's a lot of talk about, you know, on the contrary, engaging more, building our reach, building a lawyer, a, 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 a loyal readership, a, a deep loyal readership on the continent. One, one word on the, on the public, public broadcasting, European public broadcasting. Um, first of all, um, broadcasting is kind of an old word now, right? Because we know that te televisions do, you know, text and, and sometimes just sound just like traditional ex-paper organizations do sound and, and video as well. So, so I, I would, you know, I, I'm not thinking of it, I don't think it would need to be a network of just the, the national televisions, public televisions. But I think the idea of a public effort, a, a, a European public effort to create something which might be, you know, a, a, a coming together, a platform, or, uh, and especially, you know, get resources into that kind of, get resources into that kind of thing. I think that needs to happen. And I'm, I'm not sure we would need to rely on, you know, I mean, if you look at public television in, in Hungary or in Poland or, you know, uh, it, it's not, that would be a problem, right? To have, to have on the board of a European public broadcasting efforts, uh, people who are, you know, problematic in terms of media freedom. Um, okay. but, but, um, but I think that's the thinking that needs to happen and in a multimedia way and not, not just television. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm just going to call on uh, two people who I know say something about other attempts. Uh, René, do you want to say something about uh, Europe Talks, I think? And uh, just here. Thank you. Hi, I'm René Kaplan from the Financial Times. Um, just to first say that I think the Financial Times shared a lot of the concerns that you evoked, Natalie, about the question of, likewise, CV, about, about the European conversation. Certainly, we're very concerned about it, and mm -hmm. to the extent to which both that it exists and it's fragmenting, and also the extent to which that the fragmentation of the conversational space is actually making each of our national media less competent to mm -hmm. be able to, to cover it. Um, so w w we're actively trying to think about strategies to do that. Mm -hmm. There's also, obviously, a 
commercial impact, right? Where if suddenly mm -hmm. the Financial Times in a world of Brexit is, is really connotated as being quite British, we're suddenly less relevant to the European conversation. So one of the ways in which we've, we're trying to do that is from likewise thinking more deep about the coverage, doing the newsletter, which we flatter ourselves competes with yours, um, mm -hmm. is, is this initiative called Europe Talks. Um, it sh you should know that actually it's Zeit magazine in, mm -hmm. in Germany mm -hmm. um, that initiated it. It's a, it's a platform they developed. Um, and it is very simple. It's about taking people in Europe who have diametrically opposed views and are interested in having a conversation with someone who thinks unlike them. And it's a consortium of 16 European publications who are sharing this pool of interested people to have a conversation in real life, again, trying to sort of go beyond what is the digital fragmentation or the way digital fragments us. And in real life can be like face-to-face, -face, de vive voix, or it can be you know, a Google Hangout or Skype. Mm -hmm. Um, and then get together and actually have, have this moderated conversation. We will report on what some of these conversations bring about. Um, it's been actually quite extraordinary, the participation. It's about 17,000 people um, across these media have volunteered. Um, I think within the FT alone, it's about 1,700 people. Again, these numbers may seem small to The Guardian, but, um, but to, to the Financial Times, that's quite significant in terms of people who say, yes, I want to talk to someone who disagrees with me. Refreshing that people still do believe <laughs> that you can talk to someone who disagrees. No. Great, thank you. And uh, I was just going to move here. Uh, Gianpaolo Accardo, did you want to, you wanted to talk about an, another another venture in this space? Thank you. Yes, my name is uh, Gianpaolo Accardo. I'm the executive editor of VoxEurope.eu, which is a would like to be a pan-European website. Actually, it was grounded in 2014, and it was the successor of another initiative called PressEurope.eu which was also in, uh, in uh, operating 10 languages, and it was at that time operating under a EU grant. And which brings me to the issue of the business model for yeah. such kind of initiatives. As our uh, esteemed panel members have uh, pointed out, translation is one of the major issues in when you have to reach a wide public. And uh, the cost for translation and for production was covered by uh, public funding. Uh, and public funding, and in the research I, I have done in the, late, in the last years, last 10 years on uh, uh, pan-European media, uh, come, uh, is almost critical if you want to reach uh, a wider uh, European audience in its own language, um, because no, no other business model works. I mean, uh, advertising wouldn't suffice because um, uh, the, the, the public is scattered around uh, Europe, and uh, you have to, uh, otherwise you have to diversify, which is what we are currently doing with uh, VoxEurope.eu. The main activity is currently funded by uh, different grants, public grants and also private grants. And we have the B also B2B activities that fund the main one. And we let try me, to let cover... Let me just interrupt you for a yes, minute. Sorry. Just um, leaving aside the source of the money, the source of the revenue, which is obviously a clear problem, have you got any evidence about the demand side? Do you know anything about how many people are using your, 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 your output? We currently have 120,000 unique viewers per month, okay. which is honorable, but... Uh, I mean, it puts us in within the European media in uh, at a in a good place, far behind, uh, of course, Politico or EU Observer, uh, to quote some of them. But the, the 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 demand comes out from a lot of people saying we need a European public space uh, for debating. We need uh, uh, we need more news about Europe, but we need them in our languages. Otherwise, we won't understand them. And um, so we believe there is a market for that. As, at least there is a demand. The problem is the revenue. Uh, the revenue absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Before I go to the panel, I'm just going to see if anybody else in the room wants to share experience of doing a venture like this. Just before I come, is there anybody else in the room who's trying to do something else in pan-European reporting or pan-European collaborative investigative journalism? Uh, if there is, wave your hand. Uh, there's, there's a very... Not quite there. Anybody who is doing that? Okay. There's a lady in the front here and potentially another... Uh, there's a two in the front here. Okay. Yes. Uh, so, um, the paper I used to work for Repubblica is uh, in uh, Europe Talks. So we had the Italian edition last year, yeah. Le Italia Si Parla. 
which in a time of very high polarization in politics was very important to see people you know, face to face physically and also helped the paper to uh, get closer to his readers and, and create this uh, um, a trust um, environment. Um, and also Republica was is still part of LENA, which is the leading European newspaper alliance. And um, we did a number of uh, collaborative journalism projects. Um, one is uh, current now for the European elections. Uh, so it's, we're sharing resources and uh, uh, using each other reports uh, in a collaborative way. And uh, it's all multimedia. And uh, uh, we are pointing out the, uh, all the areas where the European Union is doing positive things okay. for the countries. Uh, and, and also we covered the, 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 the US election in 2016 With altogether. this association of line yeah. I'm gonna, thank you, that's really helpful. I'm gonna ask to pass the microphone uh, to the front row here, and then I will go to the person at the back who wanted to come in. Yes. Well, it's just uh, a project that we're working on. Uh, we're four journalists and we're developing a podcast, uh, which is gonna be uh, on uh, climate issues. Um, so we are two, that there's one freelancer, one editor from uh, Deutsche Welle, two people from Euractive, and we are thinking of making the first pan-European climate podcast. You know, what we found very hard was to identify who we are aiming at, really, and um, how to tell the story, because it's so, so fragmented, the story of European um, climate politics, in a way. Okay. And uh, so it's very challenging, I think, to, to develop this for a very broad audience. Yeah, that's all. But you're going to do it? I hope so. <laughs> when? <laughs> it's still in the making. Well, we're still we're writing the episodes right now. And, uh, okay, do well, it. talk to people outside. If, and, and then there was a question right at the back, which I'm assuming is on the same theme of some other kind of experimentation yeah, in this space. Yeah, uh, I'm part of a European network of, uh, well, it's uh, editorial teams from Italy, uh, France, Spain, and I think Greece was involved at the beginning. It's called Europhonica. It's the European ra um, University Radios. Um, yeah, and we do podcasts and we try to explain how the EU works to university people of like my age. And uh, the best thing about this is that it gives us the uh, the um, opportunity to be informed about the EU, to explain it in a simpler way. Um, and then each month we uh, go to Strasbourg uh, at the plenary session and we interview the MPs uh, and yeah, that. Okay. Very good. Any other, nobody involved in... Yeah, in only, only me, I think. Sorry, I, I, I didn't I see you. The last Apologies, one. please. So I am from El País in Madrid, so we do many things together, so do, you were speaking about that. But the, the last uh, thing, uh, it was presented yesterday, that was a project with the, uh, the name is The New Arrivals, that we do uh, uh, with five uh, uh, newspapers together, Spiegel, The Guardian, etc., and uh, to uh, speak about a special issue like uh, uh, immigration and uh, so I am the director of one, uh, pro one section is Planeta Futuro and we do many things about the global development and we try always to share contents from European countries also like uh, Euroactive and many other things so we are really very active in this kind of uh, work together. Thank you, thank you. Um, we're yeah. under uh, we're under some pressure of time in the sense we have to finish in five minutes because the next <laughs> session comes to come in. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask each of my panelists to pick one of these questions if they want to respond or indeed to choose another point that has come to their mind uh, from the discussion mm -hmm. we've had. Uh, no, I'm going to move. Yeah. Sorry. Maybe before we all leave, we can like use like all these energies to create a pool and to continue exchanging yes. Yes. afterwards. So like, yes, I'd discussion. be very happy if you do, do that, but the organizers will ask me to make sure that the pool is created in the, in the square <laughs> outside <laughs> at, rather at than the in the room. <laughs> so make the pool in the courtyard, um, uh, but don't, not, I mean, there's a lot of water around, but don't add to that. But um, yeah, that's a really good idea. Thank you. Uh, so I was gonna ask each panelist to kind of have a, a respond to a question and uh, 
one of the points that's been raised and conclude briefly, but I'm gonna just cheat by adding in one more question to them, which is um, some of what we've heard today is about political trends within Europe, which most of the panelists have said uh, they think makes some kind of pan-European initiative that much more urgent. Um, I suppose I'm also asking whether it also creates an opportunity because what we're seeing at the moment, if you like, in terms of European elections at the moment, is that actually there's probably more evidence of general trends in politics moving across Europe, whether they're pro-EU or anti-EU, whether they're pro-migration or anti-migration. <coughs> there's probably more Europe-wide political sentiment being mobilized at the moment than ever before. So I suppose my question, my question to the panelists, they don't have to answer it, is whether that creates an opportunity or whether rather, as Sylvie was saying, when there were really serious problems in some countries, it actually leads to a doubling down on national politics. Mm -hmm. As I say, uh, you don't have to answer that, you can take another question. But I'm gonna move from the panel in reverse direction, so I'm gonna start with Ryan, okay. and then Sylvie, and then Natalie, and then we conclude. Uh, Ryan. Uh, in the short answer is yes. Plenty of opportunity. <laughs> And we turned Brexit into an opportunity for ourselves and did a massive expansion for us, us at least, 14 people um, in London um, and keeping that bridge there between uh, continental Europe and uh, the UK. I guess I'll take a business model general response. Um, one thing I forgot to mention is that we did partnerships with 11 newspapers when we went into the 19 countries for these playbooks, including Figaro and El Pais. Um, uh, so, like, lots of... Um, uh, possibility there. I think one business model is no business model. So not in the sense that you don't have a structure, but in the sense that you don't necessarily pay people. And not in the sense of making slaves out of people because we have a funding problem, but in the sense that uh, networked um, volunteer journalism, citizen journalism, whatever you want to call it, can be very useful. Uh, we uh, worked with some people who founded a website called pollofpolls.eu and we've eventually bought them after a few months of working with them because they were frankly doing a better job than we were on the European election polling. And using their absolute passion and expertise, we're going to be able to have a polling service uh, for all 27 EU countries plus the UK um, that you'll all be able to, to access. And that was a lesson that you don't necessarily have to do things the old way you can think completely laterally and, and bring in people from a student dorm room and be just as successful. Thanks, Ryan. Uh, very briefly, I think the crisis, the political crisis that we all more or less uh, are going through at the moment makes it even more necessary. And one thing that uh, Natalie mentioned makes me think of it about European uh, broadcasting, for instance. It is true that some of the national, uh, I mean, public broadcast uh, organizations are being, um, under the rule, under the rule of uh, populist or nationalist uh, uh, governments at the moment. I think it would be very useful if we were working together, for instance, like, you know, that uh, um, those uh, public broadcasting organizations who don't have the same constraint could try to work with those, uh, let's say, Hungarian or Polish uh, public TV and radio to, see, to, to, to try to you know, show them that there's an editorial merit to work together or to work differently. And, and so, yeah, to, to answer your question, I think, yes, there is a need and, and we should do more on this. Thank you. Natalie. As, as uh, Sylvie said, we're not, we, we didn't plan to quote each other but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> repeatedly, but as she, I loved your sentence when you said, you know, European journalism al is alive. And I, 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 I believe that, uh, you know, very, very deeply. I, I'm amazed, and, you know, when you mention a pool uh, to bring, bring our, you know, various informations that we know uh, of what's going on together, uh, this, is, this is highly necessary. We, there, there are a multitude of uh, initiatives that are cross-border journalism, you know, young people launching innovative things, students, um, you know, young, younger journalists, uh, people who are very, very good at tech, at data, uh, who, who want to dig, dig, dig deep. And I think we need to map this out. We need to be, you know, sharing this and then thinking, how do we connect those things? I see so many uh, brilliant, you know, initiatives and projects that are cross-border journalism. One, one I'm involved in, which has nothing to do with The Guardian, it's called Reporters in the Field. We give grants, grants for cross-border uh, reporting, multinational teams of journalists. Um, 
the people who produce these brilliant pieces of journalism, cross-border um, reporting, etc., they then you know struggle to get them into the, the, the traditional national media, right? So, and that's, that's kind of a problem because there needs to be some kind of platform where you're going to be able to reach, you know, beyond those strictly national-based uh, media organizations. Thank you, Natalie. <laughs> um, I, I'd like to thank all of you for joining this conversation. I mean, we've talked about institutional collaboration. We've talked about individuals talking to other individuals they disagree with, which is a quite exciting thing. We've talked about other organizations that are in this space, and we talked about a variety of different kinds of content exchange. And we've also floated the idea that there's a lot of energy and ideas in the room, and it would be good to share those outside, as you say, create a pool in the square outside. So um, please join me in thanking our panelists for a very interesting discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Will. A newspaper is a vital force in a community.